So many of the questions that I try to answer around spirituality tend to have a biological bent to it. And that's exactly how we're going to approach today's presentation. And I like to I like to label this approach as quantum biology because we're looking into the nature of the self, but through the lens of biology. And that will be our kind of guiding light as we look at sound medicine. And that's why we're first going to look at the chakra system. And my interest has always been in unfolding human potential. And for me, that's not just spiritual potential, but it's also mental and emotional potential as well as physical potential. And so as you go through this, I'm my goal is to be able to share with you some of the secrets of how to do that using these ancient scientific techniques. So let's first begin by you know looking at the chakra systems from this joint perspective of both an energetic system a physical system as well as a spiritual system and we're first going to dive kind of more specifically into the chakras from a standpoint of biology and then we're going to transition to talking about sound and then looping back to the chakras through the viewpoint of sound medicine. Before we can really understand the chakras, though, it's important to understand the five elements. And for those of you who are familiar with Ayurvedic medicine, this will be a familiar concept. For those that have not explored it, I think it'll give you a much richer understanding of the chakras when you can look at it from the perspective of the five elements. The five elements are the elements that underlay all of the universe. So it's not only the composition of us, it's the composition of everything, not just this planet, but even as we go beyond the planet, we have this reoccurring theme that links all of life together in the form of the five elements. So before we even go into the chakras, it's un it's important to understand the cosmology of life itself. And I'm going to tell you that story through the five elements. So the five elements include ether or space, air, fire, water, and earth. But beyond just looking at them as a list, it's important to see them in terms of the birthing process of the universe through these five elements. So in ancient Vedic cosmology, it said that energy and vibration first combined with space or ether known as Akash. And through that combination, movement was created. And movement essentially created air. Now, when I was first studying this um, in India, I missed one really important aspect of this, which I wanted to share with you guys. And that was really, well, where did the vibration come from? And it took me years to even formulate that question because, you know, we're talking about once energy was already vibrating, meaning once life was already present, um, then it saw out Akash. So this combination of Akash and space was, uh, or Akash and vibration was the first step. But where did this vibrating energy come from? And so when I spoke, you know, to um, the masters that I was with in India, and when the question finally arose, which again, it didn't arise for years um, after looking at this, I said, wait a minute, but where did this come from? And the answer was, this was the breath of Shakti. The breath of Shakti. I thought that was so beautiful. So Shakti is the divine feminine principle in the universe. And it's that divine feminine principle that brings all of life forward. And when you have this perspective that Shakti basically took a breath, exhaled, and in that process of inhalation and exhalation began to make 
vibratory energy. That was the first movement of life, which then combined with Akash or with space. And from that combination came movement. When you have that understanding, it makes the dance of Shakti through the chakra system even more magical because through that dance, we're basically recreating that first step of creation, which is when Shakti begins to breathe and creates vibration. So as air began to move, it naturally resulted in friction. And what happens when there's friction? Well, I'm rubbing my hands right now and immediately they're feeling warmer. And that's because as air moves and creates friction, friction, you have heat production. And so that production of heat created the element of fire. And then as the fire heated particles to the point of melting, you had a process of liquefaction that occurred. And through that process of liquefaction, you started to have the formation of the element of water. And then as water combined with particles, there was then a process of solidification. And so through the process of solidification, there was created the element of earth. And so through this dynamic process of first Shakti beginning to breathe, Shakti coming to life, that divine feminine quality of nature began to inhale and exhale, that that energy then combined, that vibratory energy, which is now set into motion, then combined with Akash, leading to movement, which created air. And as that air began to move and creating friction and heat, it led to fire. And as the fire heated particles to the point of melting, creating a process of liquefaction, resulting in the production of water. And then finally, water combining with the part particles to create solidification, creating the particle, the element of earth, that is the creation story of the entire universe from a biological standpoint, from quantum biology, that this is how all of life came into being. And one of the things that I really love about Ayurveda is how much it connects our creation story to the creation of all of life, to all of nature, creating that unity. And that which is above is like to that which is below, and that which is below is like to that which is above. And that kind of summarizes this entire unifying story. And this was the importance of studying cosmology because it helped us to understand how we were created. And it was also why it's important to study ourselves because it helps to explain the world beyond just our physical experience. And for me, this has been one of the greatest um, delights of being a physician, um, an Ayurvedic practitioner, is the deeper and deeper that I go into understanding myself, the more and more I understand the universe and the more connected I feel to it. And the more I realize I'm pulsating through it, and it is pulsating through me. And so the embryo is actually formed by the same five elements that I mentioned, ether, air, or wind, fire, water, and earth. And the embryo is formed in the exact same sequence, connecting us once again to the birthing of the cosmos. We are birthed in a very similar way in which the cosmos are birthed. And again, this relationship is so important to understand because if you can understand this relationship as something tangible, not as a metaphor, but as an actual biological fact, then you start to look at this physical body as an apparatus, as an apparatus a tool of the universe, and it's just about learning how to use it and how to open the different channels 
to be able to allow for that greater connection to all of life. And the chakras are one way to begin to understand that profound effect. And I want to begin to explain the chakra systems through the five elements. Um, when I was in college, um, I absolutely loved um, learning chaos theory in my math classes. And when I learned about fractals in particular, something in my brain, you know, kind of turned on. I had started meditating when I was very, very young at the age of, of nine. And I knew that there was these patterns within myself that existed outside of myself. And when I finally saw the science of that come to place in chaos theory and in the study of, of fractals, it was the first time that I saw how patterns repeat themselves. And again and again and again in the practice of Ayurveda, um, I'm always most delighted when the patterns you know, begin to show up. So here is one of those reoccurring patterns is the way in which the five elements is organized within us. So I want to actually begin from the bottom and then go up. So the root chakra, which we're going to go into greater detail about, is connected to that element of earth. And I'll explain more what that connection means shortly. And the sacral chakra is connected to that element of water. And the solar plexus is connected to that element of fire. And the heart chakra is connected to that element of air. And the throat chakra is connected to that element of ether. And this order is really important because if you can understand the map of yourself, you can understand the map of the entire universe. When you are born and enter into this world, Brahma, the creator, places a heavy garland around your neck. It's made of your past life karma or actions, both good and bad. And this is essentially what the chakras are. The chakras are your garland of karmas, and therefore they contain all of your programs for this lifetime. And this is why for me as a physician, Understanding the biology of spiritual beings has been so insightful for me individually, but also it's the way in which I look into my patients. I am looking into them through this chakra system. And the chakra translates into wheel. They're essentially just major energy points that connect to subtler biofields that influence your body and mind. Biofields are essentially just fields of energy, and we're just beginning to discover them in modern medicine, but they have been well outlined in ancient medical systems, and the chakras are one way to describe those biofields, and there's many, many more. Each chakra is a wheel of energy that spins around its own axis. It can spin fast or slowly according to the flow and balance of energy in your biofield, and this is why when we talk about chakras being in balance or out of balance, one person's chakra imbalance may look very differently from another's. And it has to do with whether there's more energy going in or whether there's not enough energy going in, whether there's too much versus not enough. And the pattern that it ultimately expresses in the physical world is also dependent on the relationship of the flow of energy in that chakra to the other chakras. And one of the things I find so beautiful, and you know, the the only regret I really have so far in this lifetime is that I didn't learn music when I was younger. And it's one of my my goals as an adult. And that's because I didn't realize that the universe is actually singing and that our cells are actually singing. And I think musicians have a unique way of being able to see life because of their understanding of frequency. And each chakra actually has a resonant frequency, which is reflected in the sound of a bija mantra. To me, this is just beautiful because it means our whole body essentially is an orchestra and it's singing, it's humming to us. And when it's out of tune, it looks a certain way. And when it's in tune, it looks a certain way. 
And if you can see life and if you can see the body as a musical instrument and about attuning certain parts of the body and mind back to its original resonant frequency, um, if you can see it from that perspective, I think you'll really be able to understand biology at its subtlest level, which is what I refer to as quantum biology. And this picture is not meant to overwhelm, but just simply to help us to appreciate how complex and how beautiful this system is. There's 75,000 energy channels that connect with every structure of the body, and these are known as nadis. Um, when I first learned about this, when I was learning Ayurveda, um, I was in a complete panic because <laughs> I thought I was going to have to learn all 75,000 nadis, um, which I have not. Um, but to me, it's the, the big picture of understanding that we are an intricate, intricate freeway of energy pathways. And the closing or opening of any one of those influences the supply of energy or what we refer to as prana to each cell of the body. And that's absolutely amazing. And that's also why when we take only physical approaches to our health, um, whether it's in the form of a pill, or even if we're only changing our diet, it's it's not enough. And it's because we're just so much more than just that physical component. We're this complex energy system. And that is why certain nadis respond better, or you can't even access them until you start incorporating vibratory medicine. And that is where sound frequencies and light frequencies come in. The energy moves through the nadis and joins at major intersections, which are called the chakras. And that's why I've spent more time in understanding how the chakras work because they're essentially showing me this is how these 75,000 different energy channels are ultimately communicating with the body and mind. So we'll first go through each of the major chakras um, and the significance of the chakras. Every chakra has its own bija mantra, and it also has its own color. There's an entire geometry also to each chakra, and we're not going to get into the geometry, but I did think it was really beautiful that if you look from above, if you look down and see the geometry of all of our chakras, they actually all collapse down to make the human yantra, which is just beautiful. And ge yantra is just sacred geometry. And essentially what we're doing when we look at the chakras as a physician, when I look at an individual patient and I'm trying to figure out where the blocks are, what's causing them, I'm essentially trying to get that 3D view from top down, and I'm looking down to see where is the geometry off, meaning if all of our angles were as they're supposed to be, as a fully developed, mature um, nervous system is supposed to be, then the energy would run through each of these chakras and the energy would run through the 75,000 nadis unobstructed. But our karmas actually change the degree of the angles. It's very interesting. They actually change the degree of the angles. And in doing so, it changes the way that energy flows. And once energy is obstructed, even if it's to a minor degree, it obstructs the flow of that energy to the body and to the mind. And so that then results in that feeling of stagnation in some area of our life. And as we begin to unblock those karmas that are creating that geometric shift from our original shape, we are actually restoring our natural sacred geometry. So the first chakra, Muladhara chakra, known as the root chakra, is associated with the bija mantra, Lam. 
even though it's spelled L-A-M, the pronunciation is actually L-U-M. Um, but anytime if I write it down as L-U-M, um, all of my colleagues that are Sanskrit scholars <laughs> raise their hands up. But no, no, it has to be spelled this way, even though it's pronounced that way. And I, I've given up fighting with India around spellings and pronunciations. <laughs> so the Bija mantra is Lum. L-U-M is the way that it's pronounced. And the color is red. And this is located roughly at the tip of your coccyx. And if you're not familiar with the term coccyx, it's your tailbone. It's where you sit down. It's associated with the large intestine, rectum, kidneys, and the adrenal gl glands. And it corresponds to our fundamental survival needs, such as food, shelter, money. And, you know, I, I didn't add this, but I really, I'm going to add this um, from now on when I talk about the ch chakras and attachment. So attachment through human touch through human connection is a fundamental survival need. And we know this because as we study children who don't get enough human touch or uh, enough human connection, um, they will actually die from deprivation of human contact. So attachment is a fundamental need. And I'll explain a little bit more why this is so important um, in understanding this need in this chakra. And this chakra, when it is functioning properly, it helps you feel grounded and safe and secure. And it's the seat of Shakti. All right, so let's unload that for a moment, because honestly, that understanding took me 48 years of my life to really appreciate, and I'm still in the early stages. So let me give you the cliff notes on, on this one. I'm sure many of you have heard of the concept of, of Kundalini energy and opening Kundalini Kundalini energy is sitting in this chakra, and each chakra is actually associated with a different deity. And the way I look at these things is we need stories to understand life, and there's different traditions that have different stories to help us to understand life because it would it's really difficult to just go into the abstract and go, oh, there's these elements, now go and relate to them. Um, but the stories, the narrative, the way in which nature carves out a path helps us to understand life. And so one of the way in which those stories and those narratives of, of nature come up is through the different deities. And so there's different deities associated with the different chakras. And this was a major point that I missed for most of my life and only recently have been um understanding the deity associated with the muladhara chakra with our root chakra with the base of who we are is ganesha and ganesha is you know this big heavy elephant like deity that is responsible for removing all obstacles the reason it's so important to understand that Ganesha is sitting there in your root chakra is because when you are able to connect and access your root chakra, you are able to use the Shakti that is basically the form of Ganesha to open all of the obstacles in your life. And the opening of those obstacles correlate with the opening of the different chakras. Why is that so significant? Well, first of all, even just Ganesha's birth story is so significant. Um, he was created only by the Divine Mother. So he's a pure extension of Shakti. And so when Ganesha is enlivened, that Kundalini energy begins to come to life in a way that is grounded. And the one thing I really want for everyone to get out of this webinar is the importance for being grounded and in your body for spiritual evolution. Because um, that is oftentimes the most difficult part of spiritual evolution, especially as you go deeper and deeper into this unfolding, is to actually stay grounded. And I have found since 
many of the patients that sought me out when I was in India were spiritual aspirants. I have found that the majority of people, as they progress in their spiritual path, myself included, by the way, um, especially early on before getting into Ayurveda, that we have this tendency to kind of put the physical, the monetary, all that stuff aside, and we say, this is unimportant. Um, And that creates a huge imbalance, and it creates an imbalanced experience of Shakti as it goes through the other chakras, and it can create tremendous um, discomfort. And so being able to connect to this Shakti that is in the form of Ganesha, which is extraordinarily heavy and is rooted, that allows you to remove the obstacles, the karmic obstacles that are held in the other chakras in a way that reduces your overall suffering. We tend to suffer way more than is necessary. And that's one of the beauties of Ayurveda is it's um, a path to reduce suffering. So when there's issues in this chakra, it can present in many different ways. It can lead to colon issues, lower back pain, varicose veins, emotional issues surrounding money or security. It can also create a lot of issues around marriage. And what's interesting is, you know, another kind of myth that I think many people sometimes when they're going down the spiritual path, um, encounter is that marriage or relationships are somehow in opposition to spiritual progression. Um, Now, I very much believed in that and tried to avoid marriage as much as possible. Um, And of course, (laughs) my karmic journey very much involved being a wife and being a mom. And there is a beautiful quote I once heard that marriage is bondage for the sake of liberation. Now, what does that have to do with this chakra? Well, I said that security for the chakra is really important. And when you can approach a spiritual relationship, you know, whether married or not, just when there's a committed spiritual relationship, you can actually help each other to ground out this chakra and to enliven the Shakti energy there. Because as I mentioned, human connection is one of the basic necessities. Now, there are a smaller proportion of people that are able to do this alone, um, and they go on the yogic path. But for the majority of us, this is very, very difficult to do, and we're not designed for that. But even those on the yogic path, they will oftentimes still have that secure connection through a spiritual teacher. In other words, the spiritual teacher kind of is used as the surrogate for creating the secure connection and rooting the disciple into that first chakra. And that is such a significant and important step for spiritual progression. And it's it's why... I spend so much time with my patients in just helping to support this chakra because once this chakra is supported, the rest starts to happen automatically. Again, that took me close to 49 years to figure out. So I'm I'm hoping that you, um, you gain something from this and it takes you far less time than it took me. We won't have time in today's lecture to introduce the doshas with the chakras, but I wanted to at least introduce the concept because again, it brings in another element of the physical body. The doshas is again, just another pattern, this fractal of human beingness. And it's the way in which we approach our Ayurvedic um, prescriptions. And there are three doshas and they are made up of the five elements. And because the chakras are also related to the five elements, we can help to correct the imbalances held in the chakras by observing the level of imbalance of the individual doshas. And this is why Ayurveda, when practiced from this perspective, can be so profound because it literally is helping you to unravel the karma that is held within your body and mind and your chakra system. So the root chakra, which is associated with earth, is predominantly associated with 
the kapha dosha. And so whether there's too much or too little of kapha in the body, we can address that in Ayurveda and through those recommendations, whether they're herbal or they are um, dietary, um, we're able to then help to balance that chakra. It's a beautiful system, really, just so eloquent, um, how everything ties back together and how it ultimately ties back to our, our karmic cycles. When I, when I first started to really understand the human body in this way, my patients would ask how I knew so much about them just in the first visit. And I said, it's because your body is just, it's a map for your karmas. And so if you are a, a observer and if you really can appreciate what is hidden in this human body, you can essentially give somebody a map for how to attain liberation through their unique story. The second chakra is the sacral chakra. And again, as I mentioned, each chakra has a bija mantra and a color. And for the second chakra, the bija mantra is vam. Vam. And the color is orange. You know, I, um, before learning about the chakras, I almost always wore gray, black, or brown. And then when I was learning about the chakras and I just realized how colorful we actually are, um, you know, and of course we see those colors in nature. It completely changed the way that I, I dress because then clothes even became a way of being able to connect to the chakras. So I've always loved just how beautiful you know, we actually are in terms of our resonant frequencies. This is located about two inches um, below the navel. And it's associated with the reproductive system. So the testicles, the uterus and ovaries, as well as the urinary bladder. Now, the first and second chakra, you know, they oftentimes will overlap. And sometimes people say, oh, I thought urinary bladder was more the first chakra, the first and two chakras, these organs function together. So it's not so much looking at the chakras in terms of like a surgeon going, okay, this one goes here, this one goes there. But it's more of getting the feeling of kind of what are the energies that go through there and what are the organs that would then be impacted by an imbalance in that chakra. This is the seat of our creative force, our sexuality, and our raw primal emotions. And this particular chakra is where I see a lot of trauma can getting concentrated. And let me kind of unpack what that means. So this is a tricky chakra. Um, it's a tricky chakra at this particular time in part because of how we have begun to view, you know, ourselves and our sexuality, and especially for those who are in the spiritual path, the way that we tend to sometimes divide spirituality and sexuality. And it really wasn't until I got more deeply into the understanding of the Shakti tradition that I began to really look at sexuality and sexual energy in a completely different way and just seeing it as part of the dance of, of Shakti. And it also wasn't until I started to work with some of the Siddha masters in India that I began to really appreciate the power of the chakra because one thing I always saw with, with these teachers of mine was just how fluid their emotions were. Um, they really had no issues with expressing these extraordinarily raw and primal emotions. I mean, when they got angry, it was just like um, immediately there and then it was gone. Like anything they felt, it seemed to just flow so easily. And so I really looked deeper into, into this because this, this chakra is so important because it's associated with the flow of pram, prana. And it's associated with the element, you know, of water. And we are mostly water. And our body actually communicates signals, vibratory signals through water. And vibration is so easily communicated, you know, through water. And so if there are issues where, 
we are disconnected from the creative force of the and the sexual force in this chakra, we're actually blocking a tremendous amount of healing communication in that area. And what I find, again, is that when many people are on the spiritual path, there is a tendency towards getting disconnected from the emotions or thinking that there are good emotions and there are bad emotions. And what I've learned is there's only emotions. Um, they're neither good, they're neither bad, they're just simply there. And they need to be expressed and they need to be felt. Now, in the expression, we can create good or negative karma once we involve somebody else and we start to you know, do something that can be harmful to that person. But just the pure connection to our emotions is a significant part of our spiritual development and not being able to connect to these emotions and not being able to connect and understand the sexual shakti that is here can actually hinder our spiritual development. And so problems when this chakra gets blocked um, is it can definitely result in reproductive issues such as infertility and sexual dysfunction. And many women all see that come up as um, endometriosis um, or the formation of fibroids. Um, in men, it can come up as, you know, um, issues like in the prostate, inflammation, the prostate bladder issues can also be associated with an imbalance in the chakra, emotional imbalances and blocks, and especially creative blocks are oftentimes associated with this chakra. And as people start to release and open and connect to the chakra, they're oftentimes very surprised at just how much sexual energy there is there and the power of it. Sexual energy can be used for many different things. It does not have to be used just for sex. And in, again, in a committed relationship, you can transform that sexual energy even through sex um, and pull it up into the higher chakras. But sexual energy is a really important part of spirituality because it's transformational energy. And so this is Oftentimes, one of the big challenges for people is when they begin to connect to that chakra, what to do with all of the energy that may have been kind of um, hidden there for so long. And another important thing is, um, you know, as the chakra starts to open, just a degree of creativity, it's absolutely amazing. And it's through the connection in this chakra that, you know, you'll see many of the great poets or the yogis you know, when they begin in their flow of bhakti and they start to write that down, it's in part through the connection of this chakra and allowing for the creativity to flow through this chakra. So as I mentioned, all of the chakras are associated not only with the elements, but with different dosha. And this sacral chakra is associated with the element of water. And it has a combination of both um, aspects of the pitta dosha as well as the kapha dosha. So once again, when we're evaluating um, a patient and we see certain dosha imbalances, we start to correct those imbalances and then it helps to open up and bring this balance into the chakra. The next chakra is the manapura or the solar plexus or third chakra. And the bija mantra for that is Ram. Again, Ram. Ram. And the color for this is yellow. And this is located just above the navel. People oftentimes think it's right at the navel, but it's actually, it's energetically just above the navel. This chakra is associated with the organs of digestion, such as the liver, the gallbladder, stomach, spleen, pancreas, and the small intense intestine. And this chakra is very, very strongly linked to the mind. This chakra is actually a functional component of the mind, but it's linked to our identity, self-esteem, motivation, ambition, and willpower. The fastest way to change your mind, your mental health, your mental patterns is through the solar plexus. And it's oftentimes not something that people want to hear because we'd like to think that we're more than just our, our gut, but such a huge part 
of what we identify and what we see in the mind comes from this chakra. And that's why we're seeing so much in terms of the research of gut microbiome and the influence it has on mood, on neurological health. And it's because of the intricacies um, of the connection between the solar plexus or essentially our, our gut and our, our brain. This was something that fascinated me as a neurologist um, because it certainly wasn't a connection that I was taught. And once I did learn the connection, I was kind of horrified by it because I always looked at the brain as this unbelievably complex, you know, organ. And to see that it was had such an intimate relationship to the gut, which I considered as such a primitive organ, um, was a little upsetting at first. Um, and then I realized, oh, wait a minute, what an amazing tool that we can actually mold this unbelievably complex organ through an understanding of our gut and through the foods that we eat. And so it flipped it for me completely from feeling kind of, you know, belittled as a neurologist to all of a sudden realizing this very powerful tool that we have to being able to access brain health and alter our, our chronic mood disorders simply through the gut. And much of my work with patients has come from that understanding. But problems that can arise from this chakra are, of course, digestive issues like gas, bloating, stomach ulcers, liver issues, eating disorders, orders, but also things like anger, um, depression, you know, almost all of the mood disorders can come from a problem in this um, chakra. Um, issues like procrastination, when the chakra is under-functioning, arrogance, when there's too much energy coming into it, or a lack of confidence, again, when it's not enough energy. So the solar plexus is associated with the element of fire. And this is this chakra is predominantly associated with the dosha pitta, and the pitta is our fiery dosha. So when we see a pitta imbalance, either having too much fire or looking for ways to cool that down through diet, through different supplements, and that helps to balance this chakra. When there's not enough fire, then we're adding foods and different supplements to actually help to boost agni, which is considered the digestive fire. Anahata is the heart or the fourth chakra. And the bija mantra for this chakra is yum, yum, yum. And the color for this chakra is green, which I always felt that that was really beautiful, that green happened to be the color for this chakra because what is the most predominant color in nature? The most predominant color in nature is green. And if you need physical evidence of how much you are loved, all you have to do is look out in nature and acknowledge that you literally have, you know, the divine heart surrounding us. And so that's always been really a, a beautiful aspect of the fact that this chakra is associated with the color green. It's located in the chest. It's associated with the heart, arms, lungs, and thymus gland. And this chakra is linked to our developed emotions, such as unconditional love, altruism, and compassion. Now, the second chakra is also associated with our emotions. Um, this chakra is also very important for the emotions. There's a difference, though. The second chakra is associated with a lot of our, many of our primal emotions, the emotions that can be linked to like early childhood or to very strong events. Um, you can look at it as kind of the emotions that can come and go in a flash. If there's no trauma, they'll just come and go. Um, if there is trauma, then those emotions tend to get kind of held in that um, in that second chakra. And there's a youthfulness to those emotions. There's a young quality to those emotions, meaning that 
They're not completely developed yet. Um, this chakra tends to have more highly developed motions like unconditional love, um, altruism, and compassion. And so when there's problems with the chakra, it can cause you know, heart problems, lung problems like asthma or allergies or fear of intimacy, but it can also result in stunted spiritual progression. So how does an undeveloped heart chakra result in stunted spiritual progression? Our heart chakra carries a narrative in it with all of the heartache, essentially, that we have we have experienced. And as this chakra eventually begins to develop, all of that heartache has to be experienced and it has to be released. And I've always been amazed, and I'm including myself in this, in this list, of how many people I have worked with who have meditated for decades and decades and decades, but have not been able or have not known to go in and actually release you know, what is blocking the heart chakra. And it's an experience that you cannot bypass. You can't meditate your way through that. The goal of deep meditation and the goal of sound, the use of mantras in particular, is to open up each of the chakras. It's not to try to bypass the discomfort of them. And oftentimes when the pain starts to come up, because it's such a deep kind of, of, of pain, it's not the raw pain in the second chakra, it's really the heavy heartbreak that we carry with us oftentimes for many lifetimes. Um, when that comes up, it's so painful that we try to divert the process from happening by just, you know, going back up into our mind where it's safe and where it's comfortable. And when I was seeing patients um, at the Ayurvedic center that we helped to, to build in India, um, what we would see is was always kind of the same process of um, as people's physical bodies would begin to open up and clear as those nadis began to open up, that it was the emotional pain that would come up next. And so I asked my spiritual teacher, you know, how do we help people through that? You know, what do we, what do we tell them when they get to that? And her advice was always that you must go through those emotions, that the only way to finally process karma is by the experience of those emotions. And we can look at it as whatever karma was set into motion at whatever lifetime, it created a resulting vibration. And that vibratory pattern ultimately had an emotional code attached to it. And as you come into contact with that emotional code, you know, of that vibratory pattern of that karma, you have to negate it through the experience of it. So it's the experience of that emotion that actually helps to release that karma. And that's why this heart chakra is so important for, for spiritual progression. And it is kind of the lock, in a sense, that you have to open up to get to the next chakra, which is what really helps to connect you to those universal energies and that it's not until our heart actually heals that we're able to dive into those deeper spiritual experiences. And the heart chakra is really special in that because it has this deep connection to the emotion of unconditional love in particular, it has the power to transform that love into healing energy. And so many of our most profound healers when they're working on other people, what they're actually doing is accessing this chakra and just allowing that energy to go from them into the chakras of the recipient. And it's through that that um, people are able to heal others. Um, you're also able to heal your own body as you heal this heart chakra. And because love is the most nourishing energy, the heart chakra can balance all of the other chakras through this process. You know, as a scientist, um, I always kind of cringed when I would hear things like love, you know, can cure anything or love is the answer. Or, all you need is love. 
Um, to me, that was just kind of fluffy words and didn't necessarily translate into biology, um, which was my focus. Um, you can imagine my surprise when I realized that all the poets and singers and artists um, were actually quantum biologists, because it's absolutely true that this thing of love, this expression, and not romantic love, not that you can't experience unconditional love in the form of romantic love, but this unconditional love, this love which connects you to the wisdom of life and connects you to the knowing that we're all one, it is has such an incredible power for transforming biology. And it was when I understood the power it had over biology um, that I really began to become a fan of, of love songs <laughs> and love poems and everything else. And I see this very much in my my husband. My, my husband's just naturally, he's a very, very heart-centered um, human being. He has an, a massive, massive heart. And I've seen this time and time again, especially when we were in India, that the different um, masters that would come through to meet with us in India to teach us different things. They were always so drawn to him because they knew that they could give him almost any healing technology and that he could bring it to life because of this capacity. And I'll tell you, for somebody that was as competitive as I was back then, that really was annoying because <laughs> I wanted to learn it. And, you know, they always went to him because it was just, his heart was such a fertile ground for these techniques. So the heart chakra is actually the seat of the vata dosha. Vata is um, predominantly air and space. And the heart chakra is one of the organs in which it is concentrated. So again, just like the other chakras, when we're trying to balance them, um, as an Ayurvedic practitioner, we're balancing the dosha. And so in balancing the dosha, we automatically begin to balance the chakra. So the final chakra that we're going to talk about today is the fifth chakra, which is the throat chakra. And the Bija mantra for the throat chakra is hum, hum, hum. And the color is blue and it's located in the throat. And, you know, in a sense, all of the chakras, of course, are a gateway, but this is like a major gateway chakra. Once you begin to master and understand this chakra, this chakra finally takes you to kind of that promised land that we're always looking for as spiritual aspirants um, because it is absolutely the gateway into the third eye and into the crown chakra. And the reason why I'm not going to talk about the third eye and the crown chakra is really once these chakras open, what happens with, you know, the sixth and seventh chakras, it's pretty automated. It just you know, you're not really even working at that. That just begins to unfold on its own. But those chakras, the third eye and the crown, the difference really only between them is in concentration or degree. They're really the same, but as you progress kind of further, it just becomes more and more concentrated. So this chakra is really important in being able to walk through that gateway to access those other chakras. It's associated with the mouth, the throat, the thyroid gland, and the esophagus. And it's the link between our heart and our mind. And opening the heart is one of the most difficult things that we'll do as a human being. And I heard once some, somebody once say that the inches between the heart and the mind is the longest walk we'll ever take, you know. And so this chakra is really the key to that. Um, problems with this chakra, of course, can lead to thyroid disease, a frequent sore throat, or difficulty expressing feelings. Um, but this chakra, it's, it's such an amazing chakra because it, it represents our connection to our truth. Um, and it's that connection. You know, it's our ability to connect first with our own truth that allows us to be able to connect with universal truths. 
A healthy sh- throat chakra will communicate and express the feelings and thoughts of the other chakras in a way that is authentic and true, but it's also in a way in which it becomes spontaneous. You know, this is really when people start to say like the universe begins to speak through somebody. Um, and as I said, it's it's the gateway for connecting to universal en- energies because it's the gateway for connecting to mantra. And the throat chakra is also associated predominantly with vata. And the main elements it's associated with is ether. And that's an in- extraordinary, extraordinarily important connection. Um, because it is in ether that all other elements come from. And it is in ether that the divine first kind of joins its vibration that Shakti, the divine feminine energy, first joins its vibration. So ether is essentially, I like calling it the wireless, you know, communication system of the entire universe. And so once you are able to connect with that element of ether um, through the throat chakra, you're essentially you you know you know the communication system for all of all of life the settles are the causes and the gross the effects um i think that's something that this audience in particular you know understands but i think it's always amazing to me that as we work on these chakras which are really the subtle aspects of ourselves and as we connect to the doshas, the physical and the mental aspects of ourselves and how, you know, how an imbalance in those are affecting the chakras. It's amazing how much life transforms. It becomes automatic. It becomes spontaneous. That as these inner frequencies are fine-tuned, the music of your life, you know, suddenly becomes more present, um, more pleasant, I meant to say and more engaging and you know you actually are you're creating a symphony of life and and not just on the receiving end of some old program that was written from so long ago and i wanted to start with this uh slide about what is a human being because ultimately that's what we're really trying to answer because until you really understand what a human being is um it doesn't really make sense why sound is important and for for me since my training was as a neurologist um i learned that a human being was well look in the mirror and you'll see what a human being is um unfortunately as a physician this answer that you are what you see in the mirror just wasn't working um, when I say it wasn't working, it just wasn't really helping any of my my patients. They weren't getting any better by me just pointing out the things that were obvious. Or even if we looked at the things that we could see under a microscope, there was still something missing. And that's how my journey into Ayurveda began. And that was what led me ultimately into studying sound as a medical therapy. Albert Einstein was really brilliant in so many different ways. And I thought it was quite appropriate that the quantum physicists were the first ones that began to describe us differently in the Western scientific model. And he he said that we're slowed down sound and light waves, a walking bundle of frequencies tuned to the cosmos. And honestly, when I look at some of the writings from the Siddhas, um, it's not so different. It's really very much the same conclusion that we are slowed down waves. Some waves are slower than others, which is why we're able to see them. And some waves are faster, which is why we're not able to perceive them just through our senses. And that perhaps the most important part is that these waves are not random, that these frequencies are tuned to 
a higher intelligence that connects all of life. The reason that that's so important is because if these frequencies aren't just random sounds or random photons of light, if if there's an intelligence to them, then there must be an underlying code also available to us. And one of those codes that are available to us to help us to tune back to our natural frequencies is mantra. And that's what we're going to discuss next. I wanted to go over this um, one more time because I went over the cosmology of how life originated. This process is important, but there's also a reverse process. And it's important to understand this reverse process to understand the potency of sound. The reverse process is the dissolution of the physical universe and of the physical body. And it's interesting because the dissolution goes very much in the same you know, path, but in reverse. Um, you know, earth goes back into water, water goes back into fire, fire eventually goes back into air. And air, once again, becomes akasha. That's not just what we see, like with the physical decay of the body. Um, I think it's the most obvious when people are cremated, you see it very quickly go through this process. But this is also a process that the ego goes through um, as well. Eventually, as Tamas, which we tend to associate more with that earth element, as it becomes kind of lighter and the elements of water and fire start to build in it, you have more of the Rajas Guna, which is more fiery, more impassioned. And this is where we see kind of the impassioned spiritual um, practice. You know, it's very, very disciplined. It's very, very black and white. There's just a tremendous amount of structure to it. That's the nature of heat. It tends to, um, you know, it, it has that burning type of sharpness. And as we go through this phase, and all of these phases, by the way, are completely natural in our spiritual progression, um, we will oftentimes actually feel more physical heat in our bodies. That heat is necessary in the ancient texts to melt our karmas, to actually break down the karmic knots. Um, but without that heat, without that rajasic part of it, you would not have the motivation, right? Because the, the, tamasic, the, the tamasic qualities need to be heated up in order to even be motivated to move. They need to be liquefied basically, in order to move. So it's a very important phase and, you know, there should be no judgment. But then something very interesting happens. Um, eventually, as the fire is just, you're just burning and burning and burning. And I feel like this is just the longest phase. Um, but you're just burning and burning and burning, nonstop burning. You can spend lifetimes just burning and burning and burning off all of this karma. And then eventually from the ash of all of that fire starts to spring forward sattva. And this is a funny thing about sattva because you'd think you'd just be like so happy to get to, you know, the sattva. Oh, this is wonderful. I'm finally sattvic, right? Um, so what's interesting about sattva, though, is it's harmonizing. It's harmonizing with everything. It's light, um, you know, it's associated with the elements of more air and ether. And again, this does not mean that your body can't still be kaphic. It just means that the qualities in you are getting lighter. And there's actually a tremendous amount of value in having that heaviness in your body, having that kapha energy, because it allows you to stay grounded as this happens. But as you get lighter, what happens is the fire goes out. Now, this is a really critical step because this is a step where I have seen a lot of people kind of come to a standstill in their spiritual progression. And again, I'm a physician, so I'm always looking at the biology of this stuff. And the reason why this is so important, I'm going to show you how mantra can help you to overcome this step. You become more and more sattvic, you become more and more neutral. Now, 
that sounds like, hey, that sounds great. You're neutral. Isn't that what you want to be? Well, yes, yes and no. You want to be neutral, but with that neutrality, there's literally no desire. There's no heat. There's no movement. When you are harmonizing and you are neutral, there's no movement, really. Um, You get to a point, which is what Akash is, it's space is just simply still. Now, that's great if you're no longer in the body. If you're in the body and you're still, what that can look like is a complete collapse of your life, meaning there's no desire for work. There's no desire for relationships. There's just basically no desire to be here at all. That is not the point of spirituality. Spirituality is not to be in a place where there is no purpose. And that's oftentimes what can happen when people get to this place is there's no purpose. And the reason why is because there's this lack of elemental heat. You know, the the natural spiritual progression from rajas to sattva is that there's this this expelling of heat. That's what you were doing in that last phase. You were just expelling all of the heat, all the desires and everything. And so the question becomes, and how do you function? I had this misperception that the yogis that were living in the caves and everything, um, that they just weren't doing anything, you know, that they were just kind of hanging out and, you know, they were just they had pulled all of their energy from the world. I really didn't understand how much they were giving, how much, how participated they actually were, how much they were doing. It was way beyond anything I could have ever imagined myself doing. And it's because their doing now became in their beingness. But the power to do that came from the Shakti that is in that root chakra, So when your body and your mind begin to transition into that state of sattva, in order for it still to be powered and have the power to sustain the body and to be an instrument in the world, that shakti energy, which was there in the root chakra, has to come to life. It has to come become alive. And the reason why mantra is, is so powerful is mantra comes from the Akash. Mantra is a vibration that is in the Akash. And so that Shakti energy, when it is combined or when it hears the mantra, you can you can say that Shakti energy that is down here in the, in the root chakra starts to search for itself and that Shakti starts to rise. Okay. And that takes the inanimateness out of the sattvic state. It starts to animate it. And, and through the animation, there is motion And there are desires, but these are no longer the desires or the motion of the ego. This is now divine desire, and it is divine motion. And so now the divine energy or the shakti is essentially prescribing your life. But this state, and this is what we call enlightenment, as far as I can understand in terms of the biology of it, this is what we would call enlightenment, but it's not a static state. It's not an inanimate state. And for those of you who have had you know, the opportunity to be around enlightened saints, um, there's nobody that works harder. And even when they are sitting in the caves, seemingly doing nothing, they're doing more than you can ever even fathom. And it's because their shakti is at work. And for those enlightened that are meant to be in the world, you know, they're not sleeping. I mean, they're just accomplishing so much with so little effort. So this is a very important um, point because without this understanding, people can actually stay in this place of inanimation, mistakenly thinking that that's an enlightened state because it's a desireless state, but that is the state before you know, that next step, because the Shakti has to come to life. The Shakti is then then the animating force for your life rather than the ego. And 
there's many, many ways to enliven that Shakti, many, many different ways. The way that I have found for it to enliven the fastest and the easiest at this particular time in history is, is mantra. I've, I've tried almost everything. Um, and mantra is just hands down the easiest way to still function in the world and enliven this Shakti energy. So when we do a mantra practice, the ultimate goal, of course, is the opening of the knots. Okay. And these are the knots that are held in the chakras. And I, I call this the biology of spiritual evolution. These knots are of karmic origin. And you can see, you know, through the chakra system or to the, to the sheets of where these different knots are located. They can be individual karma, ancestral karma, you know, global karma. Um, it's all of your karmas kind of, you know, pulled together. And they open through the chakras, and oftentimes they are uncomfortable. They can be physically uncomfortable. They can be emotionally uncomfortable. And it's important to allow yourself to go through that discomfort, both physical and emotional, because that is actually how the karmic knots break. And once they break, there's spontaneous relief from life patterns throughout different aspects of your life once they begin to open. And it's it's like you do so much work, so much work, and you can feel like nothing's happening. Then all of a sudden, once they break open, and sometimes it takes a little bit longer for them to open, all of a sudden, things that you've been struggling with for your entire life are no longer there. And what will make this whole opening of the karmic knots be successful is just being mindful of the process rather than reactive. Once you start getting into this process where you're about to open a karmic knot, all of life participates in the most interesting ways. It can be the person at the DMV. It can be the IRS. It can be your spouse. It can be your kids. Everybody's kind of participating on a subconscious level to help to release it and if you become reactive rather than being mindful that you're in a very critical process of releasing your karma, um, the reactiveness is what pulls you back in. Now, because the physical body and the mind tie in so much, right, to these deeper aspects of ourselves, and it ties so much into how our karmas are structured. In Ayurveda, we will recommend certain treatments like panchakarma for detoxification to help with the process. And that was actually my whole reason in writing my first book, The Prime, which became a weight loss book, but it was actually a program for brain and gut health and detoxification to allow for these karmic knots to spontaneously open as people began to go into a mantra practice. So you can either go to an Ayurvedic practitioner for help with this, go for a treatment like Panchakarma, or you can look at the program that I outline in um, my book. There's some key herbs um, that can also help to make this process a little bit easier. And this is, again, one of the things I love so much about Ayurveda is it just it takes some of the suffering out of this entire process because it, it approaches spirituality through biology. These are some of my go-to herbs to help with this process. The Brahmi, Ashwagandha, and Trifla really work on the brain-gut axis, and this is the common place where there's a lot of hiccups um, as these knots are starting to open up. And the Shankapushbi helps to even out the emotion so that you're not getting reactive. So I was recently asked to start my own Ayurvedic line. And when they asked me, which herbs do you want to work on first? These were my go-to because I said they help so much with just the biology of spiritual evolution. And as I said, when these things come out, they come out through the different chakras. So I just wanted to point out what this might feel like when the root chakra starts to clear, there may be feelings of tremendous fear, or you may get constipated. Um, when the sacral chakra begins to clear, 
um, old emotions that feel very primal, like childhood emotions can come up. You do not want to block those. You want to process them. This is a great time to reach out for help to process them. What's interesting about when the mental body and the solar plexus, when they clear, because it's the mind-body junction, when the mind clears, all of a sudden your gut can shut down because of all the toxins coming out. Um, and so this is where doing those detoxification therapies are really important because your mind will hit a wall because your gut can't process anymore. Or when your gut starts to clear, sometimes all of this depression or anxiety can come out through the mind. So again, working with people who know how to interface between this makes the opening of karmic knots so much easier. And when the heart begins to clear, really, it's it's just this is where most people will stop because it's our deepest, deepest pains. But if we embrace this process as a way of gaining wisdom, this is where you will learn your karmic light, um, lessons. And as that begins to open, then it'll allow more and more light into the throat. Even though this is a generally sequential process, meaning um, it takes a tremendous amount of groundedness in your root chakra before you can really even hit some of those raw emotions. The chakras will open at different times as well. So there's a general sequential process, but then there's also an individualized process depending on kind of where the seeds of your karma are held. It's important to understand the biology of this because otherwise, sometimes when you begin a powerful mantra practice like the chakra mantra, you'll go, oh, this is not working at all. You know, I'm having all of this come out and I'm anxious and I'm like, oh my God, you're, 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 you're having an amazing experience and you just need support that you're actually having a successful mantra practice. So that's why I like going into the biology of this. My favorite mantra, <laughs> it's my favorite mantra for several reasons. Um, this was a mantra that was given to me by my spiritual teacher. Um, but it's a mantra of all of the chakras, and it's actually combining all of the bija mantras, and those are on the right side here, with some of the bija mantras from the mantra Om Namah Shivaya on this side. Okay, so what you have then is a combination of both Shakti through the Bija mantras and Shiva through this mantra. So you have a combination of Shiva and Shakti, your male and feminine divine selves coming together at the junction point of each mantra to open and resolve all of the karma. When I learned this mantra, I had been doing mantra practice for decades. I really did not think this mantra was going to be such a big transition. This mantra literally just kind of rocked my world. I couldn't believe how much was coming up after decades of doing Ayurveda, you know, doing yoga, doing meditation. It's an extraordinarily powerful mantra. And it said that this mantra has the ability to even rearrange karma that is held in your DNA. So I typically recommend only starting this for five minutes um, at first and then going up by five minute increments, maybe every week or so. Um, or you can even go slower. That's perfectly fine. And finally getting up to 20 minutes. You don't have to do more than 20 minutes a day. That way, the releasing of those knots is happening gradually and you know, hopefully comfortably. So what we're going to do is we're, we're going to do this mantra out loud and I'll lead you through that. And then I'm going to get softer and softer and softer with the mantra. And then I'm going to actually put myself on mute. And then we'll continue to just do it internally. You can look at the screen. That's no problem to do the mantra with your eyes open. But I just want to give you guys a chance to have the experience of this, of this mantra. So I'm going to put my timer on for just a few moments so that we have the experience of it together. Okay. And so I'll go ahead and start us and then you'll hear me get quieter and then I'll go on mute. You continue inside of your own mind quietly. And then when it's time to stop, I'll, I'll come back on. Okay. So just sitting comfortably, let's begin. And everyone, please chant out loud, all of us together. Hari Om Nam Lam Mam Vam 
Simram Vam Yam Yam Ham Shiva Om Swaha Hari Om Nam Lam Mam Vam Simram Vam Yam Yam Ham Shiva Om Swaha Hari Om Nam Lam Mam Vam Simram Vam Yam Yam Ham Shiva Om Swaha Hari Om Nam Mam Vam Simram Vam Yam Yam Ham Shiva Om Swaha Hari Om Nam Lam Mam Vam Simram Vam Yam Yam Shiva Om Swam I want you to go ahead and begin to finish your last round. And just slowly start to come out of the space of the mantra and back into the space of your body and feeling your fingers and your toes again and Joining back in the energy of all of the participants. Normally at home when you do this mantra, of course, we wouldn't come out that suddenly. If we had more time, I would give you several minutes to come out because this is a very, very, very powerful mantra. 